Like the office they commemorate, presidential libraries are living institutions. Certainly it is my hope that the Reagan Library will become a dynamic intellectual forum where scholars interpret the past and policymakers debate the future. Welcome to the Ronald Reagan Presidential Foundation and Institute's virtual event series. To fulfill President Reagan's mission of making the Reagan Library a dynamic intellectual forum, our Center for Public Affairs Programming offers lectures and forums presenting perspectives on important public policy issues of the day. Each year we bring you 20 to 30 events from politicians, authors, members of the media, business and military leaders, and more. During the 2020 closure of many businesses across our great country due to COVID-19, the Reagan Foundation switched to virtual programming to ensure that we were still delivering world-class content, even if you couldn't get to our hilltop to watch it in person. Now that the Reagan Library Museum is back open, we are holding hybrid programming, whereby some are in person and some are virtual. We hope you enjoyed this virtual event. In this week's Center for Public Affairs virtual event, we bring you a conversation with award-winning journalist and political commentator, John Avlon, for his latest book, Lincoln and the Fight for Peace. This is John's second book on the presidency. His first was in 2017, when he released Washington's Farewell, the Founding Fathers' Warning to Future Generations. Lincoln and the Fight for Peace is the groundbreaking revelatory history of Abraham Lincoln's plan to secure a just and lasting peace after the Civil War, a vision that inspired future presidents, as well as the world's most famous peacemakers, including Nelson Mandela, Mahatma Gandhi, and Martin Luther King Jr. It is a story of war and peace, race and reconciliation. Academy Award-nominated documentary filmmaker Ken Burns says of the book, a stunning accomplishment, an essential reminder that the Civil War, the most important event in our country's history, is very much part of who we are as a people and a nation today. John Avlon is an author, columnist, and commentator. He is a senior political analyst and fill-in anchor at CNN, appearing on New Day every morning. Following the attacks of September 11, 2001, John and his team were responsible for writing the eulogies for all firefighters and police officers murdered in the destruction of the World Trade Center. His essay on the attacks was included in a book called Empire City, which won him acclaim as the single best essay written in the wake of 9-11. We now invite you to join our virtual program with John Avlon, coming to you from our Leadership Academy Oval Office, joined in conversation by Reagan Foundation and Institute Chief Learning Officer, Tony Penny. Welcome everyone, I'm Tony Penny, Chief Learning Officer at the Ronald Reagan Presidential Foundation and Institute, and I am here today with John Avlon to discuss his forthcoming book, Lincoln and the Fight for Peace, uh, which is just a, a fabulous book. I have enjoyed it tremendously, uh, and, and I wanna hop into it. You know, One of the things that uh, really amazes me about Lincoln and the Lincoln mythology in, in America is his, his his story, his, his roots, right? When we think about Lincoln, we think about his humble beginnings in the American frontier and his rising to the highest points of power. Uh, so before we get into the book, I'd love to hear your origin story. What was it that led you into this uh, life of yours? Uh, you're a you know, CNN commentator, former editor of the Daily Beast, uh, author. Uh, you know, how, how did you get into the field that you're in? Wow, I didn't think you were gonna start there. Um, well, uh, I, I am the uh, grandson of immigrants. Um, which uh, accounts for, I think, disproportionately my, my patriotism. Um, and, and, you know, like a lot of, uh, you know, immigrant kids, and they came, you know, here 100 years ago now. But, um, but you know, I, I think their experience, uh, and this thing is typical of, of kids who grew up in, in, in immigrant families or where that experience is, is within living memory, it, it, you don't take America for granted. Um, you know, it is it is a living presence that this is a a special place, a blessed place because it offers uh, opportunity and equality and liberty, and those are uh, things that are not to be taken for granted. And um, and and I always felt uh, a, a, an obligation to the opportunities they provided me. Um, and my grandfather, my mother's father in particular, who was born in uh, Argentina and um, immigrated through Ellis Island at the age of three or four, um, became a, um, served in World War II, uh, lifelong resident uh, after emigrating to of Youngstown, Ohio. Um, you know, he and my grandmother were just two of the best people I ever knew. And they were, um, they were just gentle people and, and wise people and kind people and, um, and, and deeply patriotic. And, and I always felt a deep sense of obligation to them 
And I, I think that that inspired a lot of, of who I am. There was no one in my family who was a writer or in journalism. Um, but from a very, very young age, I loved uh, history, American history, presidential history. Um, probably coming of age, com coming into sort of consciousness right around the Reagan presidency. Um, and and I always viewed the, the American history and uh, the American presidency as one of these things that created a sense of firmament around our, 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 our collective experience. You know, this idea of civic religion, which the book talks a little bit about, um, that I think is so important. Um, and that, that I think Reagan in particular really understood. So I, I grew up in, in New York City and then my folks moved to South Carolina when I was around 14. And then I moved, um, love Charleston, but moved back to New York after college and, and worked for uh, Rudy Giuliani when he was mayor of New York as his chief speech writer uh, pretty soon after college and um, served with him through 9-11 and then uh, became a newspaper columnist uh, at the New York Sun and uh, wrote a book on the history of centrist leaders in American politics and how some succeed and some fail. Um, and then, um, you know, uh, was was writing columns and, and came up with an idea to do two, uh, one originally column, Anthology of America's Greatest Newspaper Columns with my friends, Errol Lewis and, and uh, Jesse Angelo, following the general theme of my books, which is you should write the, write the book you want to read. Um, and then um, wrote a book called Wing Nuts about extremism in American politics. Uh, when I started out at the Daily Beast, um, met my wife uh, it, it, right in there, and um, we have two great kids. And then I wrote Washington's Farewell when I was editor in chief of uh, the Daily Beast, and began this most recent book, uh, Lincoln and the Fight for Peace, just about four years ago. So here we are. Excellent. Yeah, no, it's a, it's a great story. And I love how you say, you know, write write the book that you want to read. Uh, yeah. Somehow, you know, I, I read both this one and Washington's Farewell uh, in, in in the last couple of weeks, and, and just oh. getting ready for for this conversation. Uh, and uh, to your credit, you also wrote the books that I want to read. I mean, they're they're wonderfully thoughtful and insightful, and I think you do such a really uh, quite amazing job of of taking these core kind of American identities and and pre uh, presidential figures. And connecting them to their relevance in in the modern world, and I, and I wonder when you, when you choose to write about a Washington or a Lincoln, right? One of one of the more kind of stunning visuals. I don't know if you've been out to Ford's Theater, but if you cross Ford's Theater and their new Lincoln Interpretation Center, they yep. have this giant multi-story spiral of all the books that have been written about Lincoln. And even before I started reading, I thought, well, why another book on Lincoln? And you actually address this question in your introduction because you say there's more than sixteen thousand books that have been written about <laughs> President Lincoln. But you had something different, a different take. So I wonder what, what it is, uh, you know, why was it that you wanted to write this book about Lincoln at this time? Well, you know, in some ways it is a, not a bookend from Washington's Farewell, but what Washington's Farewell was about was not just Washington's Farewell Address and a close read of a document that had been considered civic scripture and then forgotten Washington's warnings about the forces that he felt could destroy or derail our democracy that are quite pressing today. But if you fast forward, Lincoln is is president, obviously, at a time when those forces have rendered our nation asunder, right? We're, we're in the middle of the Civil War. And he yeah. is a reconciling leader in a time of radicals and reactionaries. So the mere fact of, uh, uh, of Lincoln's leadership um, as being a uniter in divided times inspired me and provide a flow through. It's questions about how democracies endure how we confront polarization and hyper-partisanship in its most extreme forms, and how wise and effective leadership can draw on the past and, 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 and connect to the present and move people forward into the future. What's different about this book, because as you say, and I know exactly the spiral you're talking about, um, and, and my editor, uh, Alice Mayhew, who passed away uh, during the writing of the book, but had been a legendary American historian, history editor, expressed skepticism as well. You know. How are you going to do anything new? Um, and I got very interested in this idea um, of how you win a peace, not just win a war. You don't really win a war unless you win the peace. And that Lincoln was anticipating this. I mean, it's not just the, the second inaugural, which is an incredibly deep spiritual um, document that represents what I call New Testament leadership uh, in the context of the book. But... Um, his vision of how the nation could reunite and reconcile um, both the rhetoric and the policies that he was beginning to put in place fascinated me. And I think it's because in part as a journalist and a writer and a historian, 
I, I, my background was in government. And so I, I'm interested in the practicality of these things. My experience as a speechwriter, you know, deep diving into the Washington's farewell, but also the second inaugural and Lincoln's last speech, which was um, a fairly practical speech guiding the nation into reconstruction. All these things interested me. And so I, I called up a couple of Lincoln historians, um, Lincoln experts, Harold Holzer, uh, former director of, of the Lincoln Library in, in Illinois, the uh, director, current director, owner of, of the Lincoln, Abraham Lincoln Bookstore in Chicago, handful of people. And I said, look, I've got this idea. Has it been done? Am I stretching? Um, and to my surprise and delight, they said, no. I remember Daniel Weinberg saying, you know, I don't think anyone's done Lincoln as a, the peacemaker yet. And I'm, I'm talking to him in a, literally a bookstore full of books only about Abraham Lincoln, right? <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, so you, know, I, I, you know, I'm happy to be lucky as well as good. But it, it, the obvious reason why, by the way, is because he gets assassinated five days after Appomattox. So, I mean, you know, it, it, that, that, he never got to implement his vision. And so as a result, when folks are doing the, the li normal linear histories, um, the end of life gets short shrift. And certainly the unfinished plans get short shrift. You know, and this is certainly his unfinished symphony. And then I take the uh, unorthodox step of carrying forward the idea, the afterlife of the idea through how we got off the right, the Lincoln path during Reconstruction, um, the role that, that Lincoln's vision for how you win a peace plays and the failures of the Treaty at Versailles when Woodrow Wilson, a child of the Confederacy and, and Reconstruction applies the wrong lessons in effect, um, where, where Lincoln's prescription of unconditional surrender and a magnanimous peace are effectively reversed and lead to the Second World War. And then how finally we applied that principle um, appropriately, directly, and I think definitively uh, in, in the occupations of Germany, Japan, and the Marshall Plan. And, you know, the quote that sparked the idea for me, the seed of the idea, is I found a quote from General Lucius Clay, who'd done the occupation of Germany after the Second World War. Mm -hmm. He was a... Um, born 30 years after the Civil War and the son of a three-term Georgia senator. Someone asked him, uh, what guided your decisions during the German occupation? And he said, I tried to think what Abraham Lincoln would have done for the South if he had lived. And, and from that quote, the, the book opened up from there. Yeah, it's, it's amazing. And I think you do such a great job of, of kind of tracing the arc of what Lincoln meant to the South. I think when we, uh, modern conception is the South was just, they didn't like Lincoln, right? In fact, you write about the celebrations that happened in the streets after the assassination. But then you have a really poignant moment with Jefferson Davis later in life, where he's talking about how important it would have been had Lincoln, you know, continued to live, that he would have been a friend to the South during Reconstruction, uh, which, which I, th I find is, is so odd. You know, how can you be hated but, but loved by people who are kind of in some of the highest positions of authority there in the South during the war? That interview uh, that, that I found, um, which Alice and other folks hadn't even uh, been widely aware of, and it was done, as you say, at the end, end of his life. And I want to be clear, Jefferson Davis is not a, a particularly sympathetic figure for lots of reasons, but um, it is fascinating at the end of his life, he's looking back and he speaks uh, really admiringly of Lincoln, who he knew um, as, as rough peers. I mean, Lincoln had only been a one-term congressman. He'd been a senator. Jefferson Davis had been a senator. He'd been, you know, West Point graduate. Lincoln had, you know, served in the Black Hawk War, you know, as an honorary captain and not never saw combat. Um, but you see that for, for all, you know, the, 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 a lot of contemporaries hated Lincoln and, and they, uh, they, they thought he wasn't equal to the time or equal to the task. They thought he was rough with an inappropriate sense of humor. But they recognized his inner decency and his digni inner dignity and his honesty. And, 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 and Jefferson Davis spoke to that. I mean, even his enemies recognized he was honest. Even at the time, it was a quality you could not credibly deny. Um, and they recognized his integrity and his character. Uh, and to see Jefferson Davis be wistful about the fact that Lincoln's death had been a tragedy for the South and the rise of Andrew Johnson, a Southerner, um, had been, he thought, the worst thing for the South. He said, and because he was a demagogue, and the demagogue is the worst of all men. Uh, yeah. um, that, that interview uh, really blew my mind. Yeah, yeah, no, it was, it, it was really fascinating. And one of the things that I'm, I'm really interested in is, uh, you know, the, the title of the book is The Fight for Peace, and, and you use this term throughout the book as well, waging peace. 
right? And and you think about I don't know I think I think about Lincoln and, and what he was going through as a leader, right? There's been a million books written about Lincoln and his leadership or Lincoln and his communication skills, and 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 what it required not only to to lead the country through that war, right? On, on one hand, he had a, a rebellious faction of of the entire country that was pulling away from him. He had members of his own cabinet who thought they were better than him and trying to undermine him. He had generals who would ignore his orders, and uh, you know, and and there's one scene where he even wrote about you know prior to a cabinet meeting where his own wife was holding his pants hostage. Uh, so you think about all these things that like he's, he's dealing with and, and you, you just think about the, the totality of it and how it doesn't drive somebody mad in a position where they have to kind of balance all those really important heavy things. But the sense I get is that at his core, he was an innately peaceful man, right? That he desired peace, that, that, but he, not that he thought, hey, you should just give peace for anything, right? That this idea of this un unconditional surrender was, was core to the peace that he wanted to establish with the South. Do you think, you know, was, was there anybody else alive who could have done what he did? With the way that he approached handling all those different kind of competing factions, uh, both internally, externally, uh, north and south. Well, if you look at the leading men of the time who had run for president in 1860, even the ones who didn't make the final ballot, um, Seward might have been the closest, but he didn't have the same common touch. He didn't have the same ability to communicate using humor. He didn't have the same humility. Seward was sort of a a haughty, haughty man by comparison. Um, and moral humility is key to understanding Abraham Lincoln as is humor. Um, and that deep absence of malice, I think Seward saw him most clearly within the cabinet. I mean, he had, you know, the team of rivals phrase that uh, Doris Kearns Goodwin made famous. Um, you do get a sense of all the different personalities in the cabinet and, and that Lincoln was able to mediate all of them and their, their ambitions. And many of them did not respect him in particular. Uh, uh, you know, Sam and Chase, Tre Treasury Secretary turned Chief Justice. Um, but no, I think you'd have to say no. Uh, and it shows how lucky we got, even though a lot of contemporaries at the time thought it was an abject disaster that the new upstart Republican Party uh, had just elected a, a, a untested one-term congressman from Illinois to be president of the United States at this moment of like maximum peril. And, and he's someone with no executive experience. Um, I mean, it's it, from a new political party. He was widely disrespected and demonized. I mean, his election itself spurs, a, you know, spurs secession, which obviously had been brewing for, for a while. Um, but because Lincoln had character, um, he was able to grow in the job, and he had a core wisdom um, where you know he didn't let his ego or his resentments make decisions for him. He was, he was very practical and peaceable. And as I say, he was a man of peace in a time of war. He was tough-minded, but tender-hearted. Uh, and, and everybody commented on that. And one of the most heartening things about Lincoln for me is that he shows that kindness can be consistent with effective leadership. And I think that's something that you know, we sometimes forget in contemporary America. Yeah, when, when you were doing the research for this book. I mean, it strikes me. I've I've read Lincoln's speeches and and you know numerous books. Not all sixteen thousand, but I've read I've read quite a few books about Lincoln. And what are your favorite? What's that? What are your favorite Lincoln books? Oh, my favorite. Uh, I I love you know the Kearns Goodwin team of rivals uh, and and leadership in in times of turbulence, which is not specifically about Lincoln, but uh, a, yeah. a number of them about them. So you know those are those are a couple of the ones. Uh, Rich Lowry wrote a really interesting one a couple of years ago uh, that that I enjoyed. Um, uh, what about you? I mean, what were some of the, the big sources? So that was my next question to you is, you know, as you're, as you're diving in and the primary source and the secondary source material, I mean, there, A, there's a wealth of secondary source material, but primary, I mean, just reading Lincoln, cozying up to Lincoln must feel so good. Every time I, I read what he wrote, it's still so resonant and powerful. Uh, but what was it like to, to kind yeah, of go through that, the process of putting this together? That's a great question because it's the guilty pleasure of it. Um, you know, I wrote this book, um, you know, while covering the Trump administration as an editor in chief, running reporters and as an anchor and analyst here at CNN. And to be spending my, my time with Lincoln at night on weekends um, was uh, a soul bath because he doesn't disappoint. Um, 
He's a man of deep character. But, you know, normally if you spend a lot of time with somebody, you get to know them. You know their strengths and weaknesses. And Lincoln had his weaknesses, by the way. It's important to understand that. Everybody does, of course. I think our historic figures are most interesting when we understand them as human. Mm -hmm. But he is never mean or petty. Um, he struggles with strong emotions. Um, uh, but he is, he is kind. He doesn't, you know, he doesn't let religion or partisan politics or, or, or personal peak um, drive his decision making. He's not motivated by resentments. Um, that, that core absence of malice that I think ultimately defines him, that flows through everything. I mean, I believe, you know, one of the things the book focuses on is the style of reconciling leadership that I've argued that Lincoln basically invents. And it's rooted authentically in his personality, though, which I, I think would be distilled primarily to empathy, uh, honesty, humor, and humility. Um, and, and, and I think from a, I think we underestimate the role that personality plays in a person's principles and their political leadership, including their policies. And, and I, I think, you know, those qualities really drove Lincoln and you just see it over and over again. And, and so he is a pleasure to spend time with. And that's aside from the enormous spiritual depth of his writing. Um, I mean, you know, I, I still think the 272 words of the Gettysburg Address were probably the best poem ever written in America. Um, uh, the second inaugural, the last paragraph is one sentence and it is as deep as it gets. And it's actually a total departure from the rest of the speech. Um, and, and, but to me, I mean, that, that sort of contains it all. So there's th this extraordinary depth of the man as a writer, as a poet of democracy, as a lay preacher. Uh, there's the practical politician who gets dramatically underrated. There's an enormous amount we can learn. I mean, the policies that he puts in place, even in 1862, that begin to set a structure to reunite the nation after the war, even though at the time, you know, they're getting, they're getting killed in the battlefield. But he and the Republicans in Congress begin to establish the outlines of a structure that can help reunite the nation by depolarizing north-south, by moving the attention west and the economic opportunity west. Um, his knowledge of human nature, his sense of humor, um, his inner buoyancy, despite the, the, the melancholy and sadness that he wrestles with, um, his love for his son, Tad. Um, it's just, I, I, I honestly, I could have spent another five years spending time with him and I would have been the better for it as a person. Um, and, and, and he is just beyond our greatest president i mean he may be our greatest person yeah yeah no you get that you get that sense and i mean one thing that really resonated with me and, and you make this point in the conclusion of your book you you obviously make the draw the comparison between kind of the you know the political polarization we have now and, and people have talked about a second civil war and it's very different you quote grant at the end talking about how you know the next civil war will be very different it won't be the mason dixon line but it's it's a different type of war and we look at how our, our country is polarized and split now and a line that really resonated with me from, from Lincoln, and I wonder where do we find this today, is he talks about the best way to destroy your enemy is to make him your friend, mm -hmm. right? And, and kind of recognizing that common sense of humanity. And I think if you asked a lot of folks today, they would say, the best way to destroy your enemy is go after him on the internet and embarrass him and, you know, whatever, whatever it might be. But how, how do we get to the point where, you know, we kind of, we have that view and, and maybe that, you know, I, I wish that they would assign this in every school in the country and kids could read about this and think about Lincoln's approach to, you know, how do you deal with adversaries? So you, you find that common sense of humanity, right? Uh, it's, uh, yeah. Yeah, I mean, L Lincoln is, um, asking yourself what Lincoln would do is a perfectly good way to go about <laughs> life in times of, of, of civic disagreement. And you're right, I mean, look, democracy depends upon an assumption of goodwill among fellow citizens. That is what has particularly been eroded in our time and was eroded in Lincoln's time as well. And it's why when you study history and why I'm so passionate about applied history is that, you know, we, we have an obligation to learn these lessons, particularly when you hear echoes of arguments or you see dynamics that led to disastrous things in the past, don't go down that path. You know, it, it, when we start dividing along regional and ideological lines and racial lines and partisan politics becomes a matter of identity and, and people feel that losing an election is, 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 
um, akin to, to losing their future, then that sets the psychological preconditions for civil war. And, and there have been a lot of books about a second civil war. And I don't think, um, you know, we're in any danger of anything that resembles what happened between 1861 and 1865. But we, when we play with forces um, that are this tribal and this elemental uh, in a democracy, and we diminish our ability to communicate, um, and we erode our trust, um, we're playing a very dangerous game. And the problem is some people do treat it as a game, just some, like some people thought the Civil War would be quick and efficient, and it would be a great, you know, cleansing Armageddon, and then we could all get on with our lives one way or another. Don't do that. Link, Lincoln understood, as you say, um, his in the, innate empathy that, you know, he didn't demonize people he disagreed with even when they called for his death. And you see that can say, even in private, by the way, not only did he not throw rhetorical red meat on the stage. Um, I mean, he would say, I, I never doubt the, you know, I may question the judgment, but not the motives of any man. You know, he said, I'm not anti-South, I'm anti-secession. Uh, um, you know, they are just what we would be in their position. Um, but he's, so he's constantly reaching out and he, and he has a very long exposition about you know, basically what the Midwestern equivalent is, is you, know, you catch more flies with honey than vinegar. But if you convince a man you're his friend, if you listen to him, then the heart, he says, is the high road to their reason. <laughs> but if you presume to dictate to them and judge them, then they will re re recoil. And, and, and the whole point was he understood that persuasion is, a, is, is, a, is, is essential to democracy. And, 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 and so empathy is a, is a way of reasoning with your opponents. And he would use humor and logic and scripture, you know, I mean, he, and he wasn't naive, you know, he believed that decency could be the most effective form of politics, but he understood that people were more likely to listen to reason when they were greeted from a position of strength. He had to win the election. He had to win the war. He wasn't, didn't have any illusions about that. But the man's honesty uh, and, and humility and humor and empathy, again, those key qualities, all are what's necessary. And, and look, I, I think these have been trying times for our sense of empathy. Um, I, I think, you know, people have bought into narratives where the other side is not merely mistaken, but evil and seems malevolent about the future of the country. And that causes deep distrust. People go into conversations or brandishing flags, um, you know, that, that are not the United States flag. It's not what unites us. It's about, you know, front loading what divides us and, and the increasingly uncivil tone. Um, and, and that dynamic is deeply destructive, but it takes enormous emotional discipline and grace, spiritual grace, I think, to uh, transcend that. And, and that is what Lincoln did. And he led by example. It wasn't just his words, which were so extraordinary. It was the very conscious power of his example. Um, uh, and, and, and one of my favorite scenes in the book, and I apologize for going on, I don't want to you know, play room for questions, but stories are better than talking anyway. Uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Lincoln is, is touring one of the big field hospitals at the end of his two-week trip to City Point, Virginia, which is behind, um, you know, really, it's, it's in Virginia and it's sort of, it's actually south of Richmond. So he's, he's on the front lines, the president. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's, you know, risky stuff. Grant's making the offense. He, he, before he leaves, he wants to go visit all the soldiers who were wounded. And it is a vast space. It's the largest hospital um, in, in the country at the time. And he's touring and he's spending time with each wounded soldier, uh, Union soldier, shaking their hand, asking them about themselves. Um, and, and, and very emotional when he sees some of the wounds about the to toss of war and, 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 and the soldiers who met him never forgot him. I mean, he was you know, one of the things about contemporary descriptions of Lincoln is it keeps coming up that he was a very ugly man. I mean, people are very unkind about his appearance. Um, but that in conversation or, or, or when telling a joke or when really connecting with somebody one-to-one, -one, something beautiful infused him. The, the spirit uh, uh, of him really shone through. Um, and people never forgot it. But he's leaving and he notices another set of tents behind the main field hospital. And he asked the doctor who's touring him around, he says, what's that over there? And he says, oh, you don't need to go there. Those are just captured rebels, wounded rebels. And Lincoln says to him, rather curtly for Lincoln, that's exactly where I do want to go. And he marches over and he does the same thing with each of the Confederate set soldiers. He introduces himself, asks their name, asks to hear their story. Um, 
And, and some of them broke down. Some of them broke down crying because of the kindness he showed and they realized that they had been fighting for a lie. Yeah, well, it's, it's, it's amazing. And I, I do think you do a great job of, of telling the story in a, in, a, in a very narrative-like way, right? I've, I've read some histories where it's, you know, it's very kind of intellectual and theoretical and, and it, you, you get lost in it, right? And what makes history so powerful in my mind is, is the, the, the same thought that Lincoln had about, you know, when he would try to convince somebody, he would tell a story or a joke, right, to convince them. I, I know here at, at Ronald Reagan would do the same thing, right? That, that I think some of our greatest political communicators realize the power of narrative and the power of story. But in you, and you're telling the story of, of City Point, and when Lincoln arrives, you know, you, you imagine he's the president, he's this conqueror who's arriving, and it's this series of mishaps, right? It's almost like an episode of Veep or something where he shows up and there's nobody there to greet him, and he's walking through these kind of hostile city streets with just six guards, and he's holding his son's hand as they kind of walk through, and all of a sudden people realize he's there, and, and you know, it's, it's almost like he's greeted, you know, by the, by the now freed slaves as, as this liberator and an almost holy figure. Uh, and it's just, it, it, it's amazing to see his arrival to that place and, and how kind of humble, but he wasn't upset about it. You know, he wasn't like, where's my, you know, how come there's no red carpet rolled out? Why am yeah. I not protected? Where's my entourage? Things that Lincoln never said. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> the comparison to Veep is, is a new one that I'm going to have to get my head around. That's hilarious. <laughs> no, I mean, I begin the book uh, with, with Lincoln's entrance into Richmond precisely because it is to me one of the most dramatic moments in American history, and it's shockingly under-focused upon. Even dual bi volume biographies of Lincoln give it a little bit of short shrift. Um, and it's this extraordinary moment. I mean, the, the Confederate capital has just fallen. It is still on fire. Lincoln goes there. The city is not yet fully secured. It's his son's 12th birthday. As you say, there are a series of surreal mishaps on the road where the president almost dies twice. You know, he's getting rowed in on a, a long boat. Um, there's no one to greet him. Uh, they, they, they get up and they're walking up and he is recognized um, by, by a few now liberated slaves, um, uh, but not by others, <laughs> you know, and, and but this, this group clusters around him and they walk up the hill towards the Capitol in Richmond. He's holding his son Tad's hand in his left hand on the boy's 12th birthday. And um, it is just such a, a, a striking uh, moment. And, and, and then his, his grace and his decency, you know, in greeting everybody, um, where he breaks down all these racial caste barriers by bowing in return to uh, an elderly black gentleman who bows to him um, and, and sits in Jefferson Davis's chair. Um, and, and, and meets with a few Richmond residents and reiterates his three indispensable conditions for peace, uh, which is acceptance of the federal union and end of slavery forever and no ceasefire before surrender. Um, you know, it, it is, it, it, it to me is just one of the most dramatic, soulful moments in, in, in American history. It's really, it's cinematic. And, and, and I, I do like the storytelling and, and, and trying to write so that there's a sense of texture and character it's not simply about, about the words of the communication of the ideas. It should be about ideas through storytelling. And you're right. I mean, that's something that Lincoln completely understood. And I, I, I show, I hope, and, and discuss in the book. Um, he got it from Jesus and Shakespeare. I mean, you know, it's speaking in parables, using humor. And some of his humor was sort of rough cut, frontier, backwoods, common sense, kind of body humor at times. Um, but, but Reagan understood the same thing. You know, the importance of communicating to people where they are, especially using humor to disarm adversaries, um, to, to, to make a human connection. Um, I mean, uh, you know, that's that's one of, of the things that they absolutely share. And I think it's a key to effective leadership um, because I think both men understood that, to, you know, the, the heart is the high road to the reason. And, um, and, and humor can be a very effective means of getting there. Yeah, well, I want to touch a little bit too on on uh, you mentioned civic scripture and kind of a, the the civic religion of of America, in, in which you know, if you look at the pantheon of kind of civically important, almost mythological religious like figures in American history, Lincoln is arguably right there at the top. And and you, and you make some of these comparisons. You talk you you know you mentioned Jesus. You talk about his second inaugural being akin to the Sermon on the Mount. You know where he's he's out and all of a sudden the sun comes out and is shining down on him and he's you know surrounded. I mean it just it. it it's, it, that's it, not it, me. That actually true. happened. But yeah. 
Yeah, but no, but but just the, the fact that, you know, the fact that he's able to walk into a still burning city, uh, you know, where any number of people wants him dead, you know, that would be, uh, you know, and then you talk about, uh, I think there's a rifleman in a Confederate uniform who kind of draws and gets him in his sights and for whatever reason, you know, doesn't doesn't end up uh, pulling the shot. But I, I want to talk about that idea of of Lincoln is, is almost this kind of American semi-religious figure. Uh, and I want to contextualize. So we had a we had a, an exhibit on Lincoln here several years ago. Uh, and the centerpiece, there were several kind of core objects in that collection and in that story. Uh, but the one that drew the most attention and the one that had kind of a degree of reverence was they had one of his surviving uh, stovetop caps. And our curator talked about when that object came in, and they had to unbox it and get it ready for display. That there was almost like this, so, uh, you know, like this solemn, religious, like you, you know, almost like you expect the box, like beams of light to come out when it when it opens up, right? And you talk about the the light coming down on him. Uh, it, is is he kind of elevated in that same way in the American mythology? Do you think? Yeah, I mean, is is Lincoln continued to be elevated? And yeah, do you think he, he obviously in your writing and in your mind, you, you obviously have a very high degree of reverence for him, right? And, and you talk about the importance of character and, and leadership. Uh, do you think that Americans generally have that same degree of reverence or enough reverence for, for who Lincoln was and, and what he stood for and why it's still relevant today? I, I, I think in general, but I think the old stories always constantly need to be made new. Um, you know, I, I think that's one of the, the reasons that we keep writing histories, you know, that, you know, um, is hopefully to come up with new ways to connect them uh, implicitly to our current challenges and, and uh, make connections that maybe weren't apparent before. Um, I do think the idea of civic religion is important. Um, and that doesn't mean blind patriotism. It means having a real appreciation in our democratic republic for our shared history and the lessons we can learn from it and the courage and comfort we can take from it so we can apply it to our own lives and our own challenges. And I think Lincoln is a particularly elevated example of that. And you know, the, there's the fact that the arcs of the arc of his life is so extraordinary that he combines opposites, you know, that he, you know, he's he's born in the south and moves north, that he's born in a log cabin and dies a resident of the White House, um, that he's a, a man of sunshine and shadow in terms of the, the own dueling nature of his his personality, that he, he loves going to the theater, comedies and tragedies are his favorite. Um, um, and, and just the way that he held himself to a, a, a higher standard, even in private. Um, I mean, he didn't ever lose his temper and occasionally he did. Um, he was disappointed in, in, in Andrew, jo uh, Andrew Johnson uh, for showing up drunk at his inauguration and expressed ill temper when he showed up at the front city point looking for a tour. Um, shocking people because it was such a departure from his typical um, demeanor. Um, but again, I think it goes comes to these questions of of decency and character and the historic record of what Lincoln did, uh, even when people weren't around. You know, he, he wasn't somebody who's changed his character when he was, you know, talking to people on the stump. That he he wasn't motivated by not only malice but uh, narrow self interest. He had an ability to transcend that, and therefore inspired people. Uh, while he's coming under uh, the enormous wages of hate. And of course, you know, one of the reasons that Lincoln, you know, he happens to be shot on Good Friday and, and that unleashes a whole, you know, days after the end of the war. I mean, and, and what's tragic is we lost Lincoln when we needed him most because he is a man of peace. He actually is a matter of personal temperament, is best suited to being a reconciler and, and a president who reunites the nation. He was not well suited given his experience and his temperament to being a wartime president necessarily. Um, and yet he did it very effectively. He's one of the only people who could have done both. And so he combined that. Um, mm -hmm. And as you say, I mean, the idea of the fight for peace, it's obvious sounds like a contradiction on the surface, but that peace, peace needs to be waged with an, with an intensity that rivals war. Um, and that doesn't mean violently, it means with concerted effort. Um, sometimes it means with an intentional step back. Lincoln was a great believer in federalism um, for all his focus on, on a strong central government to combat the excesses of state rights that led to uh, the, 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 the secession, at least. Um, it, it, you know, in his vision for Reconstruction, he very much anticipated that Reconstruction would and should look slightly different in each state because he wanted to get buy-in from people organically, ground up, that that would be more enduring. Um, he wanted to harness people's hope for the future by setting up conditions for economic expansion. 
So people would look to the future or think about their shared self-interest in the moment and not fixate on their resentments of the past. That's one of the reasons why he was very fixated on people moving west. Um, uh, you know, he, he really thought that if you know people would move west in search of fortunes, you know, in part because of the, the mining booms that had been occurring before the war and he thought would continue to happen, the economic climate in California that was just beginning to really attract people. He actually talked in his last carriage ride with Mary about maybe moving to California, San Francisco, um, after his presidency. Um, but there are so many touchstones where Lincoln's example make us better people make us better citizens, make us better Americans in a way that's not only enduring, but deeply, urgently relevant. And it's not that we're going to find another Lincoln. The idea is that he can inspire people of a similar spirit. Yeah, well, and I think I, I, that's the other interesting thing, you know, as you, as you kind of after the story of Lincoln comes to an end, you kind of trace the Lincolnian philosophy as it plays out, you know, most most directly, you know, in Reconstruction and how Johnson kind of steps away from Lincoln and just, I mean, is, is terrible, right? Arguably the worst, if not one of the worst presidents in history for uh, for a number of reasons. And then Grant, you know, ascends and becomes the president. He's not Lincoln, uh, but he embraces that Lincolnian philosophy and is able to, you know, arguably the most successful portion of Reconstruction is under under Grant, right? Where he, uh, you know, he puts down the, uh, the KKK, but he does so using the very Lincolnian philosophy of, hey, I'm going to get somebody from the South and put them in charge of this as opposed to kind of like the federal occupation, uh, which which led to all sorts of issues, right? Uh, uh, and so, it, it, in a sense, is, is one of the arguments that you make in the book that the more our leaders embrace this this philosophy of kind of a reconciliation-based leadership, the better it is both for democracy and the world? Yes. 100%. Excellent. I mean, you know, and, and that's one of the things that interests me. If you look at the founders and how they're drawing upon ancient, the examples of ancient Greece and Rome, which is one of the subplots of Washington's farewell. Mm -hmm. And the way they anticipated, they said, okay, well, here's what happened to those democratic republics. How can we set up our constitution and our republic in such a way as to avoid that problem, right? Um, but Lincoln faces a problem without precedent. There's never been a civil war on that scale in human history, let alone in a democracy, in what was the world's sole democracy at the time. So Lincoln's achievement is all the more remarkable because he can't he can't read about someone like Lincoln, some distant historic echo. You know, in our times, you know, we can read about Lincoln or Teddy Roosevelt or Churchill or Reagan, you know, whoever is a leader who inspires you to, to sort of give courage and comfort and perspective and, and apply that to Lincoln didn't have that. I mean, he had his reverence for the founding generation who were old men when he was a young man. But the situations didn't, they weren't remotely analogous. Um, Although his, his, his own fascination with Washington is a subplot, which is fascinating itself. Um, and, and one of the really inspiring things he says is, you know, that, that you know, he calls America uh, God's almost chosen people. <laughs> um, but the idea that America um, has a meaning beyond itself, and therefore we have a real responsibility. It's not, we have a responsibility to save democracy, to extend liberty and equality and, 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 and you know, the flight of civilization is on it, not because, you know, we are perfect, but because, I mean, we're the only democracy in the world. And if democracy commits suicide via civil war in 1865, that human experiment is over. Yeah. It'll be a victory for the autocrats and the aristocrats and the monarchs. And so those are the stakes he sees. Um, and, and, um, and, 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 you know, look, I think he is a, you know, I call him a soulful centrist. I mean, you know, or he's a reconciler in a time of radicals and reactionaries. And, and looking at how he, you know, is very careful. You know, he, he is, is moving towards what he sees as progress, but never too far, never too fast. Not trying to, you know, he's conscious of not spurring a backlash. And Frederick Douglass, I think, famously and, and you know, says, um, you know, judged by the, the, uh, the abolitionist perspective, um, Lincoln was was tardy, cold, and indifferent when it came to slavery. But judged by the standard of statesmen, who was bound to consult his fellow Americans on the issue, uh, he was uh, zealous, determined, and radical. And 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 so you know he he did catch a lot of grief from the abolitionists, and 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 he caught certainly grief from from uh, you know the the the, through the Confederacy and and. You know, I mean, radical Republicans did not think he was one of them. And, and, and there were peace advocates all throughout the war begging him 
to accept peace at any cost, including the perpetuation of slavery and the partition of the Union. And, and he resisted that. He resisted that. But just on every level, um, his leadership retains the force of revelation. Yeah, well, it's interesting, too. You, you talk about the, the spirit and, and, and the way in which we look at his leadership with reverence. One of the things that was new to me in your book uh, was, you know, I, I, I don't know why, why I would have thought this, but, you know, the, the idea of Lincoln as this kind of transcendent leader as a uniquely American idea. But I found it really interesting, especially when you're going into post-World War II Japan and Germany, and you talk about, you know, up front you mentioned the 16,000 books, but then you mentioned the proliferation of books and curriculum materials that appear in, in Japan and Germany that focus on Lincoln and his leadership. Uh, and so that, that to me was, was really fascinating and, and the way that he's not just kind of a, a, an inspiring American leader, but an inspiring world leader, um, you know. Yeah, as, as no, it, 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 that, that's, the, that's the unexpected twist in the book, which I think is kind of fun and we'll see how folks like, uh, you know, it'll, it'll, it'll be some folks cup of tea and it'll be uh, an, 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 an unusual detour for others. But what I can tell you is um, I love the idea of the afterlife. Uh, of an idea, of a, of a person's legacy inspiring future generations. Um, and, um, and when you look and you see how Lincoln becomes an inspirational figure around the world, and it, it's not just, you know, that he's the man who freed the slaves. It's the man who reached out to his defeated brothers after a civil war and helped, wanted to lift them back up. That that's part of his legacy as well. And, and you see it, you know, in, in, in not just, as you mentioned, I mean, the number of books. I mean, he was idolized in Japan before um, the Second World War, and that ended up being something that MacArthur could draw upon to, re to introduce democracy and to build bridges uh, between uh, the you know, two countries. Uh, and, and of course, Germany and Japan are now two of our strongest allies. Willie Brandt, the Nobel Peace Prize winner and mayor of West Berlin, uh, you know, idolized, idolized Abraham Lincoln. Um, I mean, did a pilgrimage to Springfield and gave a great speech about how he belongs to you all. But so did Mahatma Gandhi. Um, so did, I mean, the number of times that Martin Luther King quotes uh, Abraham Lincoln in sermons and speeches and letters, it, it's extraordinary. It's not just, I have a, I have a dream speech. Uh, and even Nelson Mandela, whose biographer calls him Africa's Lincoln uh, after he dies because he met hate with love, because he, um, he didn't try to vanquish his enemies, but tried to find common ground and reconciliation, even in the most dire times, which is obviously counter to human nature. The easy thing to do, the normal thing to do, um, when somebody hates you, is, is to hate them back. But of course, I mean, isn't that the best of, you know, and most profound and most difficult of Jesus' teachings? Yeah, well, and I think you make that case really well, too, when you talk about the difference between how World War I ended. And huh? World War II ended, right? And World War yes. One, the end of World War One was was punitive. It wasn't clear, uh, you know. It seemed like there, you know, Wilson who came in and, and in some senses kind of argued the Lincolnian perspective, but a lot of people didn't appreciate it because they're like, "Well, you haven't lost the lives, and you know, we don't need to be easygoing on the on the Germans. We need to, you know, kind of come down on them hard and, and exact these reparations." Uh, Versus World War II, where you know you have the Marshall Plan and the rebuilding and, and kind of this investment and, and uh, I mean it's just it's a, it, it's an amazing contrast, right? I, I think I mean obviously why you included them, but but showing Lincolnian principles working really it, well. It's an it's an extraordinary contrast, and again, I mean, <clears throat> I mean there were even things references to Lincoln um, by like Dean Acheson that were a little too obscure that I ended up taking out of the book because it involved bringing in new characters that, that wouldn't have made sense to people. But the, 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 the World War II, the generation that fought and won World War II, um, the, the example of, of Lincoln and the Civil War was very much in their minds, particularly around the principle of reconciliation. Um, that, that, was, that was in some ways his model because, you know, in, 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 in the decades after the war, um, I think particularly as the nation was, was reuniting, Lincoln, the emancipator, uh, took a back seat to Lincoln, the reconciler. Mm -hmm. um, for all sorts of reasons having to do with bad or incomplete trade-offs and reconstruction that speak to the costs of not winning the peace. Um, but what, what fascinates me about Wilson, who's a, a complicated figure, but was, was seen as a, a major historical figure by his contemporaries um, and, and diminished now, but, but is that he is a child of the Confederacy. He grows up in reconstruction. So his sensitivity um, to people who lose wars and the way that 
if people who lose wars are treated badly, that that breeds resentment and hate. And he doesn't want to extend that. So he gives a speech before Congress in 1917, um, you know, that, that talks about, um, you know, peace without victory, which, you know, you know, you know, sounds like a complete contradiction um, because in many respects it is, but he's, he's referencing really subconsciously or not his own experience as a child um, uh, growing up in the wake of the civil war. And, 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 you know, he's the only president to grow up in a state that lost a war. And, and so when he, he goes to Versailles, um, uh, you know, after the second, after the, uh, after the first world war, um, you know, the, the leader of this rising nation, um, you know, he really, on the surface, he has the right equation in mind. You know, he wants a magnanimous peace, but he messed up Lincoln's first principle, uh, which was no cease fire before surrender. You need to have unconditional surrender. And the fact that the Germans didn't have a single allied troop on their soil, the fact that they got a, an armistice without surrender, which meant they would spend the next six months negotiating a treaty, and that um, which would allow lots of backsliding, and that Wilson, the other Allied powers, David Lloyd George, by the way, President David Lloyd George, Prime Minister of England at the time, idolized Lincoln. He had a picture of Lincoln over his mantelpiece at home in Wales growing up as a child. And so he would constantly invoke Lincoln, um, you know, at home and in the United States. England was going through sort of a Lincoln mania at the time. And uh, George Clemenceau, the French prime minister, had actually been a young reporter covering Reconstruction in the United States. So there are all these points of contact in these closed door uh, negotiations around Versailles. But what happens is, you know, their people have suffered so much, as you point out, that they really want they want reparations. And Wilson basically trades reparations for the League of Nations. Um, so he ends up getting the worst of both worlds, harsh terms, weakly enforced. He doesn't get the League of Nations because he doesn't reach out to Republicans to, in, in terms of the peace detail. He won't compromise on, on, on a few key articles. And, and it, it's just a tragedy. Uh, it's as, you know, it is, it, it's, not, it's not peace, it's an armistice for 20 years. Yeah, yeah. And it was interesting, too. I was, th I was thinking quite a bit about the difference between Lincoln's kind of pragmatic politics of, you know, getting those Civil War amendments passed. And, OK, well, what, what does this person need? They need this to get this vote and get it passed, as opposed to Wilson, who was kind of more rigidly ideological. And, well, no, you should do it because it's the right thing. And I don't need the Republicans. They don't need to be here. I, I'll pass this. And obviously to his detriment, right? To his detriment. And, and then the way that, that, that Marshall and Truman learn from that example and they cultivate Arthur Vandenberg, Republican from Michigan, head of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, to pass the Marshall Plan. The way Truman says, don't call it the Truman Plan, call it the Marshall Plan. <laughs> because General Marshall, now my Secretary of State, is much more popular on Capitol Hill than I am. And, and, and you know, so, so you can see very consciously they're learning the lessons of history and applying them in a way that really did change the world. Yeah, well, we have about five minutes left. I want to give you a, a little bit of a chance you know, if I'm, I'm somebody out there watching, I, you know, I'm, I'm interested in Lincoln and I, I want to read this book. What are, what are the biggest reasons you think somebody should read this book? Well, um, I hope it's a book that people will love, that the reading of it will, will be transporting. It's not simply, I hope, um, you know, the, the, the communication of ideas, but the telling of a story and the revealing of a character at a pivotal moment in our history. Uh, that it's best, I think, American history is, is mythology but it's real. And, and the fact that this is our shared history, that the most dramatic moments do feel like mythology. They are scripted in a way that is cinematic and seems almost implausible. But this man did walk into Richmond holding the hand of his 12 year old son, um, that he did try to be magnanimous to his opponents, that he applied some of the highest ideals in our country and our culture to the most divided time the country has ever extended. Um, and that he did it with grace, and, and the poetry of democracy in his words and his actions. And to see how his ideas carried forward and the cost when we well off his path and what we gained in an enduring way when we stayed true to those principles. Um, I hope it's a book that people love. Um, and, um, uh, and I, you know, it's, it's, it's difficult when you're just releasing a book um, because you don't, I don't have any perspective on this book at this point. I've been living with it for four years. That's part of the fun for me is the constant crafting. But I do think that if one of the byproducts is that we start thinking a little bit more about waging peace, 
if we start thinking a little bit more um, about how you win a piece. Um, I, I think that is an aspect of applied history uh, that we would all do well to focus on a little more and the kind of leadership uh, that is conducive to it, that it requires strength and grace, um, strength and mercy. Yeah. And, and the last question I'll ask you. So prior okay. to... Prior, prior to coming here at the, at the foundation, I was a history teacher. Oh. Uh, and, and one of the questions I would always get from students is, why history? Why does it matter, right? And you have a, you have a beautiful answer in your, in your book to that question. But I, you know, for, for, for folks who say, well, why should I care about something that happened 100, 200, you know, 250 years ago in, in American history and how it might apply today, what would your answer be to, to America's uh, history students? Would you get in a plane with a pilot flying blind? <laughs> <laughs> I mean... History is this great gift. It's a story that's real. It's sitting there to inspire us and guide us and provide courage and comfort in our darkest times, knowing that we are not alone. That there are lessons that can be applied from people's lives and that, that we have the gift and the opportunity to apply those lessons to our current challenges. And that one of the patterns that you constantly see in great leadership and moments of history and in all of Lincoln's greatest speeches in particular is that drawing on the past, applying it to the present to guide us into the future. Um, that's where the magic happens. And that's what history provides. And it's completely consistent with the obligations of citizenship in a self-governing society. This is the price we pay for democracy. You've got to care about our country. You've got to feel invested in its success. You've got to be a part of it in some small way. And the best way to do it, to make that sense of obligation uh, real and, and outside the you know, tempestuous currents of current events that can really be almost intentionally divisive and dispiriting is to draw on history, to remember the better angels of our nature and remember that we have an obligation to learn these lessons and apply them and carry them forward while we can. Well, John, as, as someone who is very much interested in and invested in, in our democracy and the preservation of it, I want to thank you for this gift of a book. It is a, it's a wonderful book. I enjoyed it tremendously. This will not be the last time that I read it. I encourage everybody who's watching today to go out and get your own copy. Uh, John, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you so much. It's been a real pleasure. Be well. Thank you for joining us for today's virtual programming event. We hope this conversation has inspired you to share what you've learned with your family and friends and that you'll join us again for an upcoming event. And let me offer lesson number one about America. All great change in America begins at the dinner table. So tomorrow night in the kitchen, I hope the talking begins. And children, if your parents haven't been teaching you what it means to be an American, let them know and nail them on it. That would be a very American thing to do.